This is Jamie with Stonemeyer Games, and today I'm really excited to bring to you um, the top 10 list of the first person that we hired at Stonemeyer Games, other than uh, myself and my co-founder. This is Morten Monrad Peterson. Uh, Morten's from Denmark, and he volunteered for our 2012 uh, Kickstarter campaign. We didn't know Morton at all. He was a backer and then he volunteered to to help out with proofreading and playtesting and things like that during the campaign. And he continued to volunteer over the years to the point that we um, we uh, hired him as a, as a developer, essentially. And that job has mostly become Morton uh, focusing on solo game design for our games. Morton's specialty, his love of solo games, uh, brought all, the Automa system, which Morton created, to, uh, to Viticulture in Tuscany it started out with, and now it's in many of our games. Um, and Morton still works uh, part-time for Stonemaier Games, and he runs Automa Factory as his full-time job. So he's kind of made a, a, a career out of designing solo versions of multiplayer games. So I was really curious to hear Morton's list, because I myself am not a solo gamer, but Morton has a huge influence on Stonemaier Games and the, the games that we publish and the way that we publish our games. So I'm, uh, I was excited to get his list. Morton has lengthy descriptions of, uh, of why he loves the games on his list. So today I'm just kind of going to... I'm going to represent Morton here today um, and share uh, the games that he loves in the order that he mentioned them and in the words that he gave to me to share with you. So the first game, Morton was a little worried that this would be uh, ill-timed. There are two games on the, on the list that, that uh, fall into that category, but, um, but I don't think there's, I mean, uh, the first game is Pandemic the Cure. We're in the middle of a pandemic. I think Morton wants to be sensitive to that, but I think it is totally fine to mention that Morton, one of Morton's favorite games, his number 10 favorite game, is Pandemic the Cure. Here's what Morton says about it. Uh, the Pandemic series of games are very popular, but there's a core system in the games that I dislike, and that's the logistics puzzle with its route planning. However, Pandemic the Cure overcomes it by boiling the logistics down to handling just six lo uh, locations. This retains the challenge and puzzle of moving around while removing the detailed route planning that I dislike. Morton's personal preference. The game also changes up other elements of Pandemic while still retaining the original's feel. Action selection is done via custom dice, choosing how to use them and when to re-roll. Disease spread is similarly done via die rolls instead of cards. Uh, to me, dice are among the components whose tactile feel sets board games the most apart from video games. There's just something inherently satisfying about the tactile feel of rolling dice that beats flipping cards by a mile. Um, which is really interesting to hear because Pand I think what the big thing the pandemic does is, is that card system. And so it's interesting to hear um, that, uh, that Morton loves the dice system so much in this game. But I do love rolling dice, so I totally get that. I have not played Pandemic the Cure, so I can't really comment on that one. The next game I have played, though, but I'll, I'll share my thoughts after Morton's, and that is number nine, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. And Morton mentions, I should mention this, that Morton plays uh, Pandemic the Cure solo and multiplayer. He also plays Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective solo and multiplayer. Morton says this, if I were to describe Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective in one sentence, it would be an open-world, choose-your-own-adventure detective story in Sherlock Holmes' London. He says, when I dig through newspapers, uh, and there are newspapers included in the game, when I dig through newspapers to look for clues, talk to people who may or may not be related to the case, find evidence, and piece together what happened, then I feel that the game comes pretty, close darn, pretty darn close to Sherlock Holmes in a box, and I have a blast in a cozy way every time I dive into that box. The rules can be taught in two minutes, but therein lies its limitation. You can choose where to go, but you cannot choose what to do there. There's no time system, no evolving world, etc. On the flip side, this prevents the game from going on forever, which is good, uh, because otherwise, sometimes with my wife, Morton's wife, uh, I would never get out that box. We want to explore everything the story has to offer instead of trying to solve the case as fast as possible, which is actually the opposite of what the game incentivizes you to do. So Morton's actually offering some really interesting design analysis of each of these games. He's sharing why he loves them and, and some things that maybe he, uh, he finds intriguing about the game design itself. I love everything that he says about Sherlock games here, Sherlock Holmes here. I, I love those newspapers in particular, that you really feel like you are opening up a newspaper from a certain time period and... The game isn't telling you which part of the newspaper is relevant. Um, certain th things in the newspaper might be relevant now, others later. There's also a huge directory that you can look through. You can say, you know, uh, we found a, what looks like a long hair on the body. Maybe it's a horse hair. Let's go check out the carriage house. It might be, not be related at all, but every once in a while, you will make a decision like that and you will stumble upon something that is completely relevant and you will feel awesome when that happens. I love that about Sherlock Holmes, Consulting Detective. 
Morton's number eight favorite game is Mental Blocks. Uh, he mentions that he plays this multiplayer, multiplayer, and that he once played it solo as a puzzle. But this is a Mental Blocks is a game of uh, uh, using different blocks and different perspectives uh, to build a specific structure where you only know one angle of that structure. You might know the colors of certain blocks on one side. You don't know which side it is. So this would be very tough to play solo, I think. I have played this game a couple times. Morton says, in this game, you cooperate to build a 3D structure out of simple building blocks like those that you likely played with as a child. The mechanisms that make this game interesting are that you have a card showing the structure as it looks like from one of the four sides with no depth. Yeah, it's, it's two-dimensional. Um, he says that there are tweaks to this at five plus players. And you're not allowed to show your card to others. So limited information here. You have a time limit to figure out to figure out together what the 3D structure is and after each of you have a limitation. Um, and, and after that, Morton's saying, uh, uh, not only are you figuring out the 3D structure, but you can make the game more difficult by giving each player a limitation. Like you can only touch triangles or you can't talk. So there are certain limitations that each player can have to make it more difficult. He says it's harder than, you, than it might sound with lots of frantic arguing and rebuilding as each side view seems incompatible with each other that culminates in high five moments that has worked well when I've played with non-gamers and when I've played with core, core hobby gamers as well. I, I agree with Morton. I think this is a fantastic team building activity for any co company or corporation. Um, Morton says, I should add that because of errors on some of the cards, there's at least one of the challenges where they uh, not only look incompatible, but actually are, so, so that it's impossible to build a correct structure. Um, he says, let's say that didn't lead to a high five moment. I wasn't aware of that, actually. I didn't know that there were errors on any of the cards. I think we, we haven't encountered that in any of our plays, but I should look at the FAQ the next time that I play the game. Um, we've had a, a great time with mental blocks. It is a little stressful because you have this information that you have that you can't share with the other players and you're trying to convey it. Um, uh, but you, you can't do the, the intuitive thing, which, to show, which is to show other players your card. But it still leads to some really great collaborative moments. And it's one of my favorite styles of cooperative games, which is like limited information, limited perspective cooperative games. Instead of trying to beat the game and the game is beating down at you and constantly punishing you. Morton's number seven favorite game is a solo game, or he plays this game solo, it's not a solo game, and that is At the Gates of Loyang. Morton says, I love Uwe Rosenberg's games. He's such a great designer that three of his games are in his top ten so, uh, in his top ten solo games, even though his solo modes are the opposite of what I prefer. Uh, Morton says that a lot of the, the solo modes in Uwe's games are beat your own highest score. Um, instead of what Morton prefers, which is a win-lose criteria, criteria with an artificial opponent, which is Altama. Or that Morton's system is Altama. Morton says his favorite Uber games are At the Gates of Loyang, Newsfjord, and A Feast for Odin. Um, and he's also been a part of fan-made solo versions for three of his games. Morton, from those games, selected At the Gates of Loyang uh, because, it's, he says, it has enough meat on its bones to offer, well, meaty decisions without being so complex and long that it's hard for me to get to the table. Morton says it somehow achieve, achieves to combine brain burn with a calm feeling that something that there's something zen about it and the tactile feel of the vegemeeples and arranging them on your fields. Yeah. I've played this game uh, multiplayer, I think two player, and had a good experience with it. There's, there's a fun little puzzle involving how every turn you are going, if you have one, at least one coin, if you have one coin, you can gain a victory point. And there aren't many victory points in the game. But you can also then pay uh, coins to gain victory points. And so every turn you want to make sure you have at least one coin to get that easy victory point because the cost for every other point is the current level of victory points. So like the track says four, five, six, seven, sequential track, the cost of the fifth victory point is five dollars. Um, so early on in the game you're trying to buy victory points but money is very difficult to get early in the game. Money is a lot more ample late in the game but victory points are a lot more expensive. Really cool mechanism. That is number seven for Morton at the gates of Loyang. Morton plays his number six favorite game, what he calls two-handed solo. So I think he plays with uh, as two different characters in this game, and that is Marvel Legendary. Or Legendary Marvel. I forget how they actually sit on the box. Um, this is another one that I have played, but I, I don't own this. My favorite of the series is uh, Legendary Aliens, or Legendary Encounters Aliens. So here's what Morton says. He says, I'm starting to burn out on deck builders, but this one keeps on going for me. I suspect, though, that my love for it is uh, rose-tinted because it was the first deck builder I tried. 
I actually like his younger sibling, Legendary Encounters Alien. Oh, okay, Morton likes that one too. Better in many regards because of its pre-constructed three-act encounter decks that give the designers control of the story arc and tension. Its retelling of the movies hel helps because it activates my memories of the movies and so adds to the immersion and cinematic feel. However, the Marvel version is very random in the order of the cards that come out, which can lead to weird story and tension arcs. On the other hand, that randomness makes the game feel fresh much longer, and with the huge number of expansions, it keeps feeling fresh while I've moved on from Aliens. If you have played this one solo, I strongly recommend playing two-handed and ignoring the semi-co-op nature of the actual rules, which feels completely wrong to Morton. Morton has a lot of strong opinions, I think, about these games, which is great. Um, that makes him a very good solo game designer. But yeah, I, I, I've actually only played the Marvel version once, and I love the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I love the, the I read the comic books as a kid. I love that theme, so I had a lot of fun with the game. But I do love the tension of Marvel uh, Legend, uh, Mar, uh, Legendary Encounters Aliens. Uh, it just has some really cool mechanisms about how the aliens are kind of creeping up on you. Um, and I like the cooperative feeling of, of that game as well. That's number six on Morton's list. Number five is the one game of his that I own, and that is The Mind. And obviously, you have to play the mind multiplayer. Um, here's what Morton says about the mind, his number five favorite game. A group of people sits down, each with a hand of numbered cards, random numbered cards, and without communicating, they must play the cards in numerical order. It shouldn't work, right? But it does, and with the right group, it gives tension with a kind of poker face in reverse and high five moments when alternating players put down close numbers in rapid succession and win the round with just one life left. Uh, I've had many of these moments myself. I totally know what Morton's feeling about uh, feel, saying that, that tension, those hi-fi moments are awesome when you hit go boom, 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 really fast, with, especially with multiple players, and you're hitting card after card in a row, sequentially even. It's incredible. Morton says, that, need, that said, you need to get into it, go into it with the right mindset. Just one person who thinks it's silly is enough to spoil the experience for everyone. Uh, Morton, and I, I actually have experienced that. There's a few people in my game group that just think it's a dumb game and or, or not even they say it's not even a game and that does kind of ruin the experience you kind of need to buy into the idea of the game um, morton says i did make a solo mode for this one for for a challenge and the sheer silliness of the idea but as stillmeyer solo guy i must begrudgingly say that the game is best played in multiplayer format this is morton talking again morton's number four favorite game uh played he's played it both solo and multiplayer is spirit island morton says this if Pandemic and Magic the Gathering had a child created to be the thematic counterpoint to Settlers of Catan, then the result would be Spirit Island. It's a co-op game where you increase your power and play satisfying combos of cards with special abilities to keep the metaphorical fires on the board in control long enough that you can claw your way to meeting one of the victory conditions. In my opinion, Morton's opinion, the game works best with multiple players because of the increased opportunities for combo plays and the increased play area. You can play it multi-handed solo to achieve the same, but to me that becomes just a tad too brain burny, so I prefer this game in multiplayer. I can totally see what Morton's playing there. When I've played Spirit Island, I am almost entirely immersed in what I am doing because there is a lot going on. There are a lot of choices to make and at simultaneous play, which I love, uh, the game would be hours and hours if it wasn't simultaneous play. But I love that you're making these decisions in real time and collaborating at the right moments, but I am very focused on what I'm doing and how I can best use my spirit uh, to fight against the invaders. This I think is now the number 13 game on the Board Game Geek rankings and it's made for my friends at, at Greater Than Games. Awesome game, awesome, awesome co -op, cooperative game. Uh, and that's Morton's number four favorite game. His number three favorite game is another Pandemic reference, Pandemic Legacy Season 1, which Morton played solo. He says this, I know I said that I left games out from the same series on the list, uh, kind of what Morton was referring to, how he consolidated the Uwe Rosenberg games. Uh, and Morton says, I already have a Pandemic game on the list, but given the legacy nature of this one, and really how different it is from Pandemic The Cure, I feel that it's okay to include it. He says, given the campaign and the legacy nature of this game, a major part of the experience is to play all the way through, uh, 12 to 24 games. Since it's much easier to get your gaming group together when said group has a size of one, I, uh, I like to blast through the campaign without forgetting where you were in the story and which new rules were added during the previous plays. That's much harder to do in the multiplayer in multiplayer format, and if you should get bored, no one will be angry if you stop playing in the middle of the game. Uh, Morton is loving the solo nature of this game. 
He says, the evolving rules, permanent effects of your actions, and story during the campaign gave me one of the best board experiences ever with a nice cinematic feel. Um, that's awesome to hear, especially since Morton was a huge part of the design for uh, The Rise of Fenris, which is not a legacy game, but it is a campaign game where, where the decisions you make have, have a huge impact on future games. Uh, Morton designed the solo aspect of the solo variant for that game, solo version of that game, not, not variant. Um, and Pandemic Legacy Season 1. I actually, I, I, it's an odd thing. I find Season 1 more memorable than Season 2. Season 1 has these strong story beats that you just can't forget that, that left our group. Um, I don't know. It was, it, was just, it, it was an amazing group experience to play it. At the same time, I love the different paths that you could take in Season 2. It, it led to maybe a less memorable, fewer memorable moments, although one in particular I really do love and remember. But I love that the, the, there are all these branching paths in it. And I'm fascinated to see what they're going to do with Season 3, which I think is due to come out this year. Morton's number two favorite game is On a Rim, which is he has played the solo and two-player. Morton says, when I, when I want to unwind, there's nothing better than On a Rim. Its card play hits the sweet spot for that kind of trivial and brain burn. That sweet spot and the whimsical, dreamy artwork creates a calm and cozy feel that I love. Uh, Morton does have something, uh, I guess I should say, a small trigger warning here. Um, Morton ha has uh, something very personal that he shares here, but he has shared it openly on his blog in the past, and I, I think it's kind of uh, important to share this, this side, that uh, gaming isn't all smiles, but gaming can bring us some joy in the darker moments of our lives. Here's what Morton says. When I'm in the clutches of, de of, de of a depression, Morton has gone through some depression, this combination of features has made the game just right for distracting me from the black pit in my mind without overloading my mental capacity that's reduced during those times. Um, thank you for sharing that, Morton. Morton says the game comes with seven mini expansions and has uh, two promo expansions. You can play with any combination of them, which mixes up the core set set collection mechanism enough to keep it interesting for a long time. Do note, Morton says, that the art is very divisive and a lot of people find it childish to the point where it detracts significantly from the game. Morton's number one favorite game. I think I've heard Morton talk about this. I know actually really nothing about this game. I've not played this game. Um, but I'm fascinated now by it that he put it as, as number one. He's played this game solo, and that is Dawn of the Zeds. Morton says, while zombies have been done to death many times over, that this tower defense game nails the zombie genre at an order of magnitude better than any other game Morton has ever seen. I've never played a game that feels so much like being in a zombie movie. And Morton actually says just being in any movie. I'm putting zombie in there. Morton says it's hang by the skin of your nails tense with, a, with tons of interesting decisions and has both strategy and tactics. He says the one cost to all this, of all this awesomeness, is the ton of special rules and exceptions, and lots of output randomness that is common for heavy Ameritrash and war games. What he's referring to there is randomness where um, you roll some dice and the outcome of your decision is determined by what you roll, instead of rolling some dice and then um, having some randomness there, but then determining uh, what happens next based on which dice you choose to activate, or maybe which dice you choose to re-roll, things like that. But I definitely need to give this game a try now that uh, Morton loves it so much, now that I know that. So, Morton, you are a wonderful part of Stonemaier Games. I love that you share this list with, with, uh, with me and the people who subscribe to this channel, especially uh, the solo uh, gamers on this channel who, who I think have asked me many times to talk about solo games. I'm not a big solo gamer. I, I, I played The only games I really play solo or are, are digital, um, and it's against the AI, so it's not really against the automata, things like that. But so, Morton, thank you for sharing. If any of you watching this have some thoughts that you'd like to share on these games or you'd like to share some of your favorite solo games, this is a great place in the comments to do so. I think Morton will be paying attention to the, paying attention to the comments and chiming in about those solo games as well. All right. Thanks.